Hello. The episode you're about to listen to is part of a multi-part series introducing an overview of Japanese history. This is a repeat of one of the original projects the History of Japan podcast was built on, and is intended to serve as an update and supplement to these original works. After 10 years, my hope is to return to this approach and to do it a little bit better given the skills that I have improved in the intervening years. If you haven't been doing so already, you should listen to these episodes sequentially, starting with episode 501. Without any further ado, enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the History of Japan podcast, episode 519, The Low Conquers the High, part 2. Last week was all about the great clans brought low by the period of civil war known as the Sengoku Jidai, or Era of Warring States. Today is about the reverse, clans which rose from comparative obscurity to power, prestige, and greatness during the turbulence of war. In other words, today is about the flip side of that term Gekokujo, the low conquers the high, that is so often associated with this age. And I can't think of a better place to start that conversation than with one of the most powerful families to emerge from the age of civil war, the Morty clan. Now, the Morty have a pretty elite genealogy. They would claim descent from Oe no Hiromoto, a rather fascinating figure from the early age of samurai politics. Oe was an aristocrat of Kyoto, descended from a long line of aristocrats who had served the imperial government under various emperors. However, Hiromoto himself is notable for turning his back, in a sense, on that tradition. In 1184, he received an invitation from one Minamoto no Yoritomo to travel to Kamakura in the remote east of Japan. Yoritomo was, of course, on his way to taking the title of shogun and setting up Japan's first warrior government the Kamakura Bakfu. There was just one problem. Yoritomo was trying to set up a warrior government, but didn't have a lot of experience, you know, governing. He was a politician, a man good at crafting alliances and building relationships, but not a bureaucrat who had a clear idea how to run the new center of power he had promised to establish to advance warrior interests. And so he reached out to several aristocrats of Kyoto with experience in the civilian government of Japan's emperors, including Oe no Hiromoto, whose brother had already taken up in Yoritomo's service, and who returned to Kyoto in 1184 to recruit more experienced bureaucrats to the future shogun's cause. Naturally, he reached out to his own brother, and Oe no Hiromoto took up the job offer. Oe no Hiromoto would become extremely influential in the new Kamakura Bakufu, as Yoritomo's government was known, helping to set up the Mandokuro, essentially the administrative office of the Kamakura government, responsible for collecting revenue and managing expenses, which I am given to understand is one of the more important features of a government in the first place. Hiromoto would also be an advisor first to Yoritomo, and then, after his death, to his wife, Hojo Masako, who would come to more or less run the Kamakura Bakfu behind the scenes before his own death in 1225. Hiromoto had four sons, of whom the youngest was named Oe no Suimitsu. As the fourth son, Suimitsu was not going to inherit leadership of the family after his father's death, but in the 1200s, inheritance laws were more equitable than they would later become. All of Hiromoto's children would get something. And so Suimitsu, in the tradition of the time, took what he got from his father's inheritance and established a new branch of the family. He also took a new surname to distinguish his line from the main Oe branch, taking the name of the most valuable shōen or tax-free estate his father bequeathed to him. That shōen was called Mori in what was then Aiko County, Sagami Province. Today, it's more or less Kanagawa, just south of Tokyo. Mori Suimitsu, as he's known, became the ancestor of a family that, over the course of the Kamakura years, shed what was left of their aristocratic identity and took up the identity of samurai, full-time warriors, the line between those two roles still being somewhat fuzzy at this point. They were not, to be frank, particularly important during the Kamakura years, serving as one of many gokenin, or direct retainers of the shogun. 
Over the century or so of Kamakura rule, they spread all over the country, with the Mori line breaking into various branches of its own. As a result, when the Kamakura government came crashing down in the 1330s, different branches of the Mori found themselves on different sides of the fighting. Fortunately, only one of those branches matters to us. That branch is descended from Mori Tokichika, who in the later Kamakura years actually did attain a position of some prestige as one of the senior members of the Rokuhara Tandai, the agency of the shogunate responsible for keeping an eye on things in Kyoto. However, Tokichika was forced to retire by a political rival who boxed him out of power, and spent the rest of his life in political seclusion in Kowachi province, where according to some legends he met a young warrior by the name of Kusunoki Masashige, and taught him the art of battle. Mori Tokichika's son and grandson would, during the wars between the northern and southern court which came after the fall of the Kamakura Bakufu, side with the southern court and its renegade emperor Go Daigo. However, Tokichika's great-grandson, Mori Motoharu, would defy the rest of the family and join Ashikaga Takauji, possibly having been instigated to do so by his great-grandfather. I should say Motoharu joined the fighting on the Ashikaga side eventually, he was only 16 when the war started, so it took him a while to get there. Still, Mori Motoharu grew into the role of an adept commander, serving the Ashikaga with distinction, and in particular was part of the invasion force sent in the 1370s to subjugate far-off Kyushu, which had become a bastion of southern court power during the Civil War. Motoharu was also responsible for bringing his family to the place they are most associated with. By the early 1300s, the Mori clan had, thanks to its service in government, acquired estates and land holdings scattered across Japan, from the Kanto Plains to remote Echigo on the Japan Sea coast, to the Chugoku region of western Honshu. Motoharu in particular inherited from his great-grandfather a Showen estate called Yoshida in what was then Aki Province, now it's Hiroshima Prefecture in the western part of Honshu, and over the period of war between the northern and southern courts, ended up settling there to manage his lands directly. His descendants would remain in the Yoshida area as Kokujin, warriors whose local presence made them influential in the region and responsible for managing affairs in the provinces, but they were very much not a part of the elite class of Shugo families who dominated the politics of the Ashikaga shoguns. And there the Mori family remained until the rule of the Ashikaga shoguns began to collapse in the 1460s. At the start of the Age of Civil War, the Mori were in a very precarious position. They were moderately powerful Kokujin, to be sure, but they were also surrounded by other Kokujin families looking to take advantage of the chaos to expand, not to mention several powerful Shugo families with multiple provinces of land to their names, and a bit of avarice in their hearts for more. Most notably, the Ouchi and our old friends from last week, the Yamana clan, were both powerful multi-province Shugo in western Japan at the start of the Age of Civil War, which made the position of the Mori tenuous to say the least, because any one of their powerful neighbors could make a play to gobble them up at any time. Thus, for the first few decades of the Sengoku years, the Mori clan leadership spent most of its time and energy just trying to survive against powerful enemies like the Yamana and Ouchi, or branches of the family because continued splits in the family line, did threaten the occasional internal clan war. It wasn't really until 1523 when the clan emerged as a serious contender in the power politics of the time, led by Mori Motonari, 26 years of age when he took office. Motonari's life had already been, to put it lightly, a wild ride. He was the second son of Mori Hiromoto, the head of the main Mori clan branch, and a uninspiring leader, let's call his father. What I mean by that is Hiromoto got his butt whooped by his more powerful neighbors in the Ouchi clan in a fight early in his second son's life, and agreed to step down as part of the subsequent peace deal, going into retirement and then drinking himself into an early grave. One of his father's vassals took over the family castle afterwards and banished the young boy, who earned the name Kojiki Wakadono, the beggar prince roughly translated. By this point, Family headship passed to his brother, Mori Okimoto, but in 1516, Okimoto died under unclear circumstances. Motonari became the guardian of the new family head, his nephew, Mori Komatsumaru, 
but in 1523 the sickly Komatsumaru also died, and finally the remaining vassals of the Mori settled on Motonari to lead them. And this proved a prescient choice, to put it mildly. Motonari had clearly established himself by this point as a talented war leader. Even before taking command of the clan, he fended off an invasion from the neighboring Aki Takeda family, unrelated, by the way, to the more famous Takeda of central Japan. And I really want to note that proven talent as a winner was important for a daimyo because wars during the Sengoku era were deeply mercenary. To be fair, this had always been the case, we'd seen this in past episodes, but particularly during this time, the ability to win was essential to the continued survival of any military leader, and not just because it involved avoiding invasion. You might have noticed that samurai during this period, or really any previous period, didn't feel themselves too bound by tight notions of honor and duty. Certainly that language got flung around a lot, but most vassals were not above replacing a master who was unable to pay them consistently. Clever administrators during the Sengoku figured out that they could arrange for their warriors to have fixed stipends to keep them loyal, but you know how it is then with people wanting annual raises. I mean, cost of living adjustments just are what they are, my lord. So being able to keep your vassals happy required either increasingly effective exploitation of your lands as they demanded more and more from you, and there's a limit on how much you can do that, or more easily, taking land from a neighbor. To be fair, the majority of your army wouldn't be professional mounted samurai because over the course of the Sengoku years, military forces shifted away from small elite bands of warriors to more infantry-heavy approaches dominated by the Ashigaru foot soldier conscripts who were often not even from warrior families at all. Instead, they were simply the sons of merchant or farmer families or whoever who pledged themselves to summon such vassal or lord in exchange for a regular paycheck. And these Ajigaru had many advantages. For one, they were very cheap to outfit and train compared to a mounted warrior. One famous document from this period, the Household Laws of the Asakura Clan, enjoined future daimyo, quote, even if you own a sword or dagger worth 10,000 pieces of silver, it can be overcome by a hundred spears each worth a hundred pieces. Therefore, use the 10,000 pieces to procure a hundred spears and arm a hundred men with them. You can, in this manner, defend yourself in time of war. To quote a much later general on the same subject, quantity has a quality all its own. But these guys, too, wanted to be paid. After all, that was the only reason they'd fight for you, and so we're back to the same problem. Victory and the cash it provided was essential to funding a military which you needed in turn to make sure one of your neighbors didn't decide you made a tempting piñata to whack until a paycheck for their own retainers fell out. And as the clan's new daimyo, Mori Motonari, would prove he was, in fact, a winner leading his family to enormous prosperity and power over the course of half a century. Things didn't start out super promising, I should note. Immediately upon taking power, Motonari had to win a civil war against his own half-brother and a group of vassals who preferred said half-brother. After he won, he executed all of them. I guess family is complicated sometimes. Shortly thereafter, Aki province was invaded by a powerful neighboring family, the Amago, who did succeed in forcing Motonari into vassalage at sword point. Still, despite what I think can be called an unfortunate start, Motonari's position was better than it seemed. In particular, the Amago did not offer particularly harsh terms, because they wanted to secure the province quickly in the face of a nearby rival, the powerful Ouchi clan, who controlled the western tip of Honshu. Motonari took advantage of their desire for a quick resolution to the conflict, accepting vassalage and playing the part of a now very loyal Amago follower, while carefully seeking out those disgruntled with Amago rule and recruiting them to his cause. In 1525, Motonari led a mass defection of Amago clan vassals to the Ouchi, landing a huge blow against his ostensible masters, and of course securing very good terms for his new vassalage with the Ouchi, who were very happy to welcome a talented young warrior who was willing to land blows against their mortal enemies for them into their service. Now the Ouji themselves are actually a pretty interesting story. Much of their power as a clan was not based on the land, but at sea. 
Their position along the calm waters of the Seto Inland Sea was very strategic. All trade headed to Kyoto from either Kyushu or the mainland of Asia had to pass by them, and the family had invested in both a substantial fleet and friendly relations with neighboring pirate bands who roamed the area to hang on to their ability to control that trade. They also held the all-important Congo, or Tallies, a subject worthy of its own good tangent. You see, by this time, China, the most powerful civilization in Asia and in the 1500s arguably still the planet, was ruled by the Ming Dynasty, founded in the 1300s by rebels who freed the regions from Mongol rule. The first Ming emperor, known to the history as the Hongwu Emperor, envisioned a harmonious and largely insular society and viewed foreign trade with suspicion. As a result, he wanted to restrict it heavily. Only vassal kings who acknowledged the Ming emperors as their overlords could trade with China, and only at fixed intervals. The Ashkaga shoguns were among these vassal kings, thanks to Ashkaga Yoshimitsu's prudent but much maligned decision to accept nominal submission back in the 1400s. As a result, the shoguns were issued a book of Congo, or tallies. Those tally books were full of one copy of a sort of trade certificate issued by the emperor, saying that in year X of the reign of Ming Emperor Y, representatives of King Z were allowed to come to such and such a port for the Japanese Ningbo on the central coast to trade. You had to bring the tally with you, and when you did, it was matched by a local official against an exact copy kept by the emperor's government. When an emperor of China died, new tallies were issued, with the swap happening the next time a country sent a trade mission. As the Ashkaga government began to collapse, it was the Ouchi who eventually occupied Kyoto from the Hosokawa who managed to get control of the tallies, and thus the Ouchi began to engage in trade with China on the shogun's behalf. And of course that made the Ouchi absurdly wealthy and kind of a big deal, and Mori Motonari seems to have been either content to serve them or unable to see a way out of it, and stuck loyally by the family until the 1550s, when the Ouchi suddenly and spectacularly imploded. Part of the issue was that the wealth of the China trade started to dry up. In 1523, the Ouchi sent a trade mission to Ningbo, but so did the rival Hosokawa clan, who we talked about last week. You see, after the scuffle between these two clans over Kyoto, the Ouchi came away with the current set of tallies for the reign of the Jungde Emperor, but the Hosokawa nabbed an older set that was lying around from the reign of the Hongzhi Emperor. Both clans sent trade missions which arrived at the same time, and which ended up fighting each other in a literal street battle in the middle of the city of Ningbo. This was not the first time Japanese traders made a nuisance of themselves in China. In one previous instance, Ouchi merchants had paid to have a Chinese merchant who stole from them killed, and in another, the Japanese delegation got into a fight with another diplomatic delegation for unclear reasons, but the 1523 brawl was the last straw. In the aftermath, the emperors of the Ming eventually decided to ban the Japanese permanently from Chinese ports. That ban wasn't officially lifted until the 1800s, and while covert smuggling did continue, especially early on, it massively dried up the China trade. Which was not great for the Ouchi because they were very dependent on that money. Also not great for them was the mental collapse of their daimyo, Ouchi Yoshitaka. Yoshitaka took the reins of the Ouchi in 1529 and initially was a very gifted warrior, but he suffered a series of brutal defeats in the 1540s, including one where his deeply beloved son and heir was killed in the fighting. Yoshitaka began to sink into despondency and neglect running his territories, leaving the Ouchi listless and leaderless, and of course shortly thereafter he lost the confidence of his vassals. In 1551, one of the most prominent Ouchi vassals, Sue Harukata, rose up and deposed Yoshitaka, who was forced to commit suicide. Mori Motonari initially didn't do much about this. While the later histories of the Mori clan would protest Motonari was loyal to his master and just held back out of a strategic understanding of the balance of power, it's a bit hard for me to escape the sense that Motonari saw this whole thing as kinda useful. After all, he now had a ready-made excuse to 
avenge his master, which in turn gave him cover to seize power for himself, without any accusations that he was engaged in some sort of improper usurpation. And, after all, join me against Sueharu Kata, a man who's clearly only in this for himself, was a much easier sell than join me against the Ouchi, your longtime leaders who have done pretty well for you up until this point. We don't know what precisely Motonari was thinking, of course, though I certainly lean towards the more cynical interpretation, but regardless, what comes next is pretty clear. Motonari bade his time for five long years before declaring war against Tsuiharu Kata, who he accused of usurping the rightful power of the Ouchi and marshalling his armies. He'd spent the intervening years, of course, planning for what came next, and I have to say, pretty good plan. Motonari had already chosen where the decisive battle of his war would take place, Itsukushima, an island off the coast of the Mori family holdings in Aki province. That island, also known sometimes as Miyajima, is today a picturesque world heritage site. Itsukushima Jinja, the main shrine of the island, is the one with the red tori gates built into the water, and honestly, if you've ever seen tourist or travel photos from Japan, you've almost certainly seen it. It's also, like Nara, home to a wild deer population that's allowed to roam about freely, and like Nara, the little bastards are quite willing to take advantage of any unsuspecting tourists. The first time I went, one of them ate the map right out of my pants' pocket. In the 1550s, though, Itsukushima was less known as a tourist trap and home to ill-tempered wildlife, and more as a strategic hub in the middle of the shipping lanes across the Inland Sea, as well as a major commerce hub in its own right. Motonari's plan was to move his forces there to convince Sue Harukata to launch an all-out attack on the island and try and crush the rebellion in a single blow. Once he did that, Motonari would abandon Itsukushima. Why abandon it rather than make a stand? Because the Mori had a big fleet at their disposal, and the plan was to trap the attacking Sue on the island and then annihilate their whole force in one fell swoop. To supplement his own pretty big navy, Motonari even cut deals with the pirate clans of the Inland Sea just like the Ouchi before him. Most notable among these were the Murakami, a massive pirate band with roots going back to the 1100s, who were by this time one of the largest pirate groups in the country. They even began to claim titles and grandiose histories for themselves, though they had no legitimate legal claim to any of them. Motonari begged for the help of the three branches of the Murakami, even going so far as to marry one of his sons to a Murakami daughter. It's not actually clear whether the Murakami took him up on this, because after the Age of Civil War, the Murakami were legitimated as a samurai family, and rewrote their family histories to make it seem like they'd always been loyal to Mori Motonari, which we know from the historical record was not true. It seems likely that at least a few branches of the group did come to his aid, and with their help, or without it possibly, Sue Harukata was indeed crushed, and within a few years, Mori Motonari was able to roll up the remaining Sue territories and make himself the new master of Western Honshu. Motonari would ostensibly retire as daimyo in 1557 in favor of his eldest son, but practically this was more of a training wheels exercise to allow that son to get used to leadership while Daddy Dearest continued to call the shots. And actually, Motonari ended up outliving that son who died in 1566, and saw his own grandson installed as daimyo before his death in 1570. By the time of his death, he was the master of no less than eight provinces along the western coast of Japan, an absolutely meteoric rise to power for someone who'd been a vassal a decade and a half earlier. We'll come back to the Mori actually quite a bit in subsequent episodes, but we're going to leave them here for now, and take a look at another clan that rose from obscurity in the Sengoku period, the Date, all the way on the other end of Japan. Like the Mori clan, the Date claimed for themselves a very illustrious heritage, stretching back to the northern branch of the Fujiwara clan, a branch of Kyoto's greatest aristocratic family, who used their influence to conquer and personally rule the northernmost part of Honshu before being crushed by Minamoto no Yoritomo during his rise to power. Unlike the Mori clan, from what we can tell, this illustrious genealogy was completely made up which to be fair was actually more common for families in the Sengoku period, the vast majority of the powerful samurai families that emerged during the chaos of the Warring States were more like the Date than the Mori, 
They were minor provincial families of warriors, not descendants of major warrior clans from pre-Civil War Japan. However, when the conflict ended, many of those families just made up histories that gave them a more illustrious backstory, essentially claiming legitimacy for themselves by inventing something out of nothing. In the case of the Date, their history pretty clearly traces not to the northern Fujiwara, but to one Tomomune, a warrior who was among the Gokenin, or personal retainers, of Minamoto no Yori Tomo, the first shogun of the Kamakura Bakufu way back in the 1100s. For his service to Yoritomo, Tomomune was awarded a shoen, a tax-free estate, in Mutsu province in the far north of Honshu. The main village of that shoen was named, you guessed it, Date, and thus he changed his name to Date Tomomune. As a side note, you sometimes see his name written as Idachi Tomomune or Idate Tomomune. Those are variant names of the same place that were used, from what we can tell, pretty interchangeably early on. That said, Date is the most famous name associated with both the village and the family, so for ease of recognition, I'm just going to stick to that. Now, obviously, being rewarded for service by the Shogun was kind of a big deal, but it's important to note here that Date Tomomune was not what you'd call a famous figure by any stretch. Mutsu Province was not exactly a prime posting. The largest of the traditional provinces of Japan, it covers parts of what's now Fukushima, Miyagi, Iwate, Aomori, and Akita prefectures, and was basically the right half of the northern tip of Honshu. To put it somewhat impolitely, Mutsu was the middle of nowhere, the sort of place the Kamakura Bakufu cared about only because ignoring it could make Mutsu into a base for bandits or anti-government subversives. And Date Tomomune wasn't even the Shugo of this remote province. He was a Gokenin and a Jito, responsible for policing the estates of the region. Still, one supposes a job is a job, and for a hundred years the Date served the interests of the Kamakura Bakufu loyally. In the 1300s, the Date leadership came down on Team Southern Court in the war against the Ashkaga. Rather unusually for a samurai family, they continued to back that cause all the way to the end. Seriously, from what I can tell, they didn't even try to switch sides once, which is frankly pretty astonishing compared to basically everyone else. Still, while the loyalty is commendable, they didn't do a great job picking a side to be ride or die for, but the Date did have one big advantage. Mutsu Province was, again, the ass end of nowhere, and so actually sending an army to deal with them was a huge pain that no one really wanted to bother with. Seriously, the war ended in the 1390s, but the Ashkaga shoguns didn't even bother bringing the Date to heel until 1415. And even then, the Date got a slap on the wrist. No more supporting renegade emperors, or you go to timeout. In exchange for a promise of loyalty, the Date clan leadership was granted a lot of influence in Mutsu, though not the title of Shugo. Presumably actually giving them the boot would have required a lot of time and energy that nobody wanted to invest, and so a more favorable deal was cut. When Ashkaga rule broke down in turn in the 1460s, the Date clan was once again insulated by fortunate geography. The fighting in the north was limited, presumably because it once again was so remote the region was not seen as worth anything, and so the clan faced comparatively few threats to its rule. In turn, for much of the Age of Civil War, the Date were a sideline presence, content to manage their existing territory, fight the occasional skirmish over borderlands, and focus on issues of internal administration rather than throwing themselves into the battle for control of the country. At least, that was true, until Masamune. Date Masamune is probably one of the most famous figures of this period, both for his accomplishments and for his truly iconic fit, as the kids say. A childhood illness, smallpox being the most common explanation, disfigured his face and left a huge scar over one eye, which he wore an eye patch to conceal. He also, and this might sound ridiculous, but it is true, had an absolutely incredible hat. Seriously, if you look at the kabuto, the helmet for his armor, it is instantly recognizable. It's a giant crescent moon that looks for all the world like some anime craziness, but it is real. Masamune was not the only one with an outlandish hat. Other leading members of the warrior class had similarly stylized signature get-ups, the idea being to broadcast one's presence on the battlefield, both to inspire the troops and demonstrate your own courage in a sort of come-at-me-bro way. If you see the giant crescent moon floating about the battlefield, 
You know Masamune is on the scene, and if you come for the king, my friend, you best not miss. Still, before he was known for his excellent taste in headwear, Date Masamune was just a young man, the eldest son of Date Terumune, who became the clan's daimyo in 1578. Terumune was an impressive leader in his own right, a talented general, he managed during his life to expand the Date holdings in Mutsu and maintain friendly relations with the most powerful neighboring clans in other provinces, including an up-and-coming fellow by the name of Oda Nobunaga, about whom we'll have more to say in the future. Terumune was also an able administrator. He invested a lot of his tenure in office not into war, though there was plenty of that too, but into surveying territories to ensure he got his fair share of taxes, which is to say, as much as he could get. In 1584, Terumune retired and handed off the role of daimyo to his then 17-year-old son, Masamune, the idea being, as we saw with the Mori, a sort of phased transition to leadership. The idea was to ensure some sort of stability in the transition. Unlike Mori Motonari, Terumune's attempt to do this would go astonishingly poorly. To be fair, it wasn't really Terumune's fault. One year after his retirement, Terumune decided to step in and help his son negotiate with a neighboring daimyo, Nihonmatsu Yoshitsugu. The Date and Nihonmatsu had been fighting on and off for a while at this point, and now both sides were looking for a truce. Terumune decided to negotiate this personally, given how delicate the situation was. It's not totally clear what happened next, but during the negotiations, Yoshitsugu decided to kidnap Terumune. His thinking is not clear. Was that always the plan? Did he just not like the offer he was getting? Regardless, what seems clear is that Yoshitsugu was going to use Terumune as leverage to get what he wanted, a better peace deal from the Date. If that was the plan, though, he didn't think it through very well. When Masamune got word of his father's kidnapping, his first thought was not time to negotiate, but time to chase Yoshitsugu down and shoot him. Which, to be fair, he did manage to do, but in the ensuing scuffle, his father was killed too. Which, what a tragedy. Or was it? Pretty much since the moment it happened, there have been some who suggested Masamune deliberately got his father killed, or even killed him personally. After all, with Terumune gone, that whole training wheels thing was over. Date Masamune would be the one really calling the shots. Indeed, Masamune's own mother, known to history as Yoshihime, eventually came to believe this and in some tellings began to conspire with Date retainers to remove Masamune from office by poisoning him and replacing him with his younger brother. Masamune handled this calmly and rationally when he got wind of it by exiling his mother and decapitating said younger brother, which I guess solved the problem, but wasn't really a great way to beat the I would murder my father to seize power allegations. Masamune spent years campaigning against the Nihonmatsu to wipe them out, of course to avenge his father, but also to expand his power base in Mutsu. And when this dragged him into war with other neighboring clans who not unreasonably began to fear they would be the next targets of this expansionist teenager, Masamune made war against them too. His approach to war was also singularly brutal. One of his earliest campaigns against a vassal who declared independence from the Date because he didn't want to take orders from a teenager ended when Masamune captured that vassal's castle and ordered everyone inside executed, even though they had surrendered once it was clear they were beaten. And keep in mind, this is not just an act of extreme violence. All these warrior families had been intermarrying for generations, so like as not basically everyone on both sides is related to some degree. Masamune's expansionism didn't win him a lot of friends, but by 1590 they did see him crush the opposition, and in control not just of Mutsu, but parts of its southern neighbor, Aizu province as well. Reunification, which we'll get to in the future, would see the end of his expansion, but regardless, Masamune took the clan very far in a short span of time. And frankly, both he and Mori Motonari are great examples of the kind of person who I think tended to get ahead during this period. They both dressed their actions up in kind-sounding language, avenging a betrayed lord, dealing with my father's killers, all that good stuff. In reality, they were about as cynical and self-serving as you could get. They were morally flexible, ambitious, and very open to the possibility of violence to advance their agenda. 
And yet it's worth noting that for all their worldly glories, it was not these two men or the many others whose stories are like theirs, but whom we don't have time to talk about here, who came out on top of the Civil Wars. And I think there's a clear reason for that. In the future, though not next week, we're going to begin looking at the so-called Three Unifiers of Japan, who will end the Civil Wars. And they too were ruthless and violent and all those things, but there's one other aspect to their rule I think tends to escape a lot of notice during this period. While other daimyo treated administration as important to their rule, certainly, the Three Unifiers made it central and were very concerned about how to administer the territories they've conquered, for maximum advantage to themselves. They will understand, to quote a thinker from a very different time and place, that the sinew of war is infinite money. Simply put, they were nerds. Deadly, violent nerds. And we will get to those nerds in a future episode, but for now, that's all for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This show is a part of the Facing Backward podcast network. You can find out more about this show and our other shows at facingbackward.com, and support the network at patreon.com slash facing backward. Special thanks to those who have given at our shout-out tier, Yan Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostocker, Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Karen Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prine, William Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Hrushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Kat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, an anonymous Anna's Hummingbird, Mark Sai, Gil, Leslie Ikuta, Trash Taste Enjoyer, John, Christopher, Harrison Reese, Inoue Enrio's Ghostbusters, NihongoKaisen.com, Shimao Toshio's History of Japanesia podcast, A House Is a Perfectly Cromulent Mascot, The Fish I Catch Are, Rhodes Scholars Compared to Samuel Alito, Schmuck, and Everything Changed When the Fire Nation Attacked. Next week, we'll put a bit of a pin in the chronology and look at some of the social and economic developments during this time. For now, that's all for this week. Thank you very much for listening.